Good morning. Welcome to New Life Fellowship. You guys look good today. You guys look good. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he's talking about you. You look good today. Now turn to your, your, your other neighbor, the one you chose second, tell him uh, you look good too. <laughs> My name is Milton Guardado. I'm the youth director for New Life Fellowship. And I just want to say thank you for choosing New Life as your place of worship. Did you guys enjoy the worship today? It was awesome. It was amazing. Well, listen, uh, we, we've we been talking about the different festivals. Pastor's been preaching about the different uh, festivals that uh, the Jewish people have, have uh, partaken in. And it's all led to what we're going to talk about today, which is, the, which is the Day of Atonement. Now, this is the day we're calling today's uh, message, Celebrating Freedom. And whenever we talk about freedom, I can't help to think about Independence Day, right? Um, you guys know Independence Day? Amen. <laughs> Independence Day, what is Independence Day? Independence Day is the day that Will Smith won our freedom from aliens. No, 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 my bad. That's the wrong Independence Day, my bad. Uh, here it is. It's Independence Day is, is we celebrate 4th of July. We celebrate freedom from Great Britain, right? And we celebrate the right to not have to drink uh, tea because we're coffee drinkers, right? America, we're coffee drinkers. We love coffee. If you like tea, do not do not raise your hand because we will we will tell you off. All right, no, but uh, <laughs> thank God that we're not uh, we we got our freedom. We don't have that uh, the Britain accent. Um, but I feel like some of you would have liked that, right? You would have been like, "Good day, Governor." <laughs> you know. Um, but we celebrate uh, we celebrate freedom, and when we talk about freedom, we're we're talking about free from bondage. Uh, Escaping our past, free from from former government, and entering into a new place where, that we can call our own, right? And so when we talk about freedom, we're talking about all these things, free from bondage and, and all these things. But the great thing is that back in the day, when we've been talking about, when we're talking about the different festivals, one of the things that it was leading to was the Day of Atonement. And atonement, um, I believe is in your notes, it says to make amends or reconciliation between God and people. And what, what was so great about God is that he wanted his people to be free. He, he wanted his people to have freedom. He wanted his people to exercise the right to be able to live without being in bondage, without being in slavery, without living in the past, without living in a, in a, in a, in a, in a place or a lifestyle that has somebody bonded. He wanted freedom. So, so he had this day called the Day of Atonement. And... When we, when we start talking about the Day of Atonement or the process of purification, we begin to read in Leviticus chapter 16. And what God wanted to do was bring freedom to his people. And he instituted one day that everyone could come and be free. Now, what would happen on this day would be that the priest would, would have to go in and, and speak on behalf of the people. However, when we begin, the, when we begin reading Leviticus chapter 16... We begin with the death of Aaron's son. Aaron was the high priest, and his sons were priests also. Now, the reason that they died was because they went into the, pre to the presence of God without God giving them access to go. Um, when, when we talk about the Day of Atonement, it's a time when the priest was able to go to the presence of God and cry out to God on behalf of the people. However, the access to God was limited. It was limited to one day a year. And then so Moses begins, uh, God begins to tell Moses, hey Moses, listen, if you don't want your brother to die, tell him to follow the process that I'm about to give you. And that's the process that we begin to read in Leviticus chapter 16. He begins to tell uh, Moses that, he, they can only, that, that Aaron can come in only once a year. And it has to be when God says it is. Uh, he starts to tell him what he should wear. He starts to tell him what he should sacrifice. He starts to tell him what he needs to do in order to gain freedom for everyone. And the first thing that he tells Aaron to do is to bring freedom to himself into his household. Now this is what Leviticus chapter 16, 11 says. It says, Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. And he is to slaughter the bull for his own offering. And it also says that he needs to bring a ram. And so what, the first thing that God wanted Aaron to do 
before, when he comes to God, before he enters into the temple, into the tabernacle, enter to the Ark of the Covenant, what, what God wanted Aaron to do was first make reconciliation for himself. He wanted to make sure that before he began to intercede for others, that he was cleansed himself. And, and so God wanted to make sure that Aaron's heart was ready. He wanted to make sure that his house was clean. He wanted to make sure that his family was atoned for or his family was reconciliated with God. And so that was the very first thing. His, his, his own sin first had to be removed. Then he tells them that he needs to make atonement for the nation. This is what it says in Leviticus chapter 16. I'm about to tell you how it all makes sense with us today. In, in Leviticus chapter 16 verse 15 says, he shall then slaughter the goat for the, for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way, he will make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanliness and rebellion of the Israelites. Whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of the meeting which is among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. Now, God knew that there was rebellion in the place, in the pe with the people of Israel. He knew that there was sin. They, uh, as a matter of fact, not too long ago before this passage, the, the people of Moses had gone to, to make tablets. And when he came back down with the Ten Commandments, they were worshiping a, a, a calf made out of gold. They, they worship different idols, and, and it bothered God. And it said, that's not what my people should do, worshiping other idols and, and praying to false gods. It angered God. But God said, you know what? Even though they, they deserve to be destroyed, I'm going to give them a chance to reconcile with me. And so he made this day. And he's giving, he's giving him uh, instructions. He's giving Aaron instructions. This, this is an important process. You need to go through this process. You need to cleanse yourself. You need to cleanse your family. You need to pray for your family. Then I want you to go into the gap and begin to pray on behalf of the people. Now, in order for there to be amends, there needed to be death. There needed to be blood. There needed to be a sacrifice. There needed to be something placed on the altar in place of our sins. So something had to die. And so here is God telling him, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go in for the nations. He said, I want you to go get two goats. One of them is going to be set free into the wilderness. But the other one is going to be slaughtered for me. And it's going to be brought to the altar. And in that way, we're going to make amends for their sin, for the sins of, of Israel, for the sins of the nation. And then... God wanted him to make atonement for the sanctuary because not only was the nation in rebellion, but the sanctuary was violated. Because what began to happen was not only was their heart apart from God, the, the sanctuary was being violated in the sense that instead of bringing God the very best sacrifice, instead of bringing God the very best offering, instead of bringing God a, 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 an animal without blemish, without spots, they were bringing God leftover and sickly animals. The animals that were, that were going to be killed off anyway, they said, well, we're going to kill it anyway. Let's just give it to God. And God says to Aaron, you need to make amends for how they treated this altar. You, you need to make this altar right again. They need to understand that this is a, a holy place and this is a holy God and that God's altar deserves God's, uh, the people's best. This is not leftovers. This is not to bring God whatever I'm not going to use. This ain't goodwill. This is a place, a holy place of God. And he tells Aaron, Aaron, you need to make this sanctuary right again. What your people been doing ain't right. So you need to come in, cleanse yourself Pray for your family. Make sure they're right with God. And then as they come into, when you come in, pray for the nation. Because, man, those people are whack. Those people are rebellious. Those people are sick spiritually. So you need to come in. You need to pray for them. And then you need to pray for the sanctuary that's been violated. Come in, pray to God and say, God, ask forgiveness for this. Make an offering, a sacrifice offering that is worthy to, to, for a king to receive. And you make atonement. And what's so, it's so crazy about Aaron's story is that Aaron was the only one that was able to make this atonement. 
It was only the high priest that was able to enter into this tabernacle. And, and what's amazing is this, that the Ark, of the, Co- uh, 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 the Ark of the Covenant was in a separate room. There was a curtain that divided. There was a curtain that came in between people or the priest and the, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence. So not anyone could just walk into God's presence. As a matter of fact, another thing that they told Aaron to do was to light an incense, an incense so that there could be a cloud that would be able to cover the covenant so that he could be allowed to be in the presence of God. Because anyone who was in the presence of God would die if they were to be along with God. So he said, make sure, you, there's a, make sure that there's a cloud, make sure that there's something covering. Something was always in between you and God. Access was limited. Now, what's so amazing is this, that we no longer live in, in the law. We, we, no, we no longer live through what Aaron had to live for. Why? Because 2,000 years ago, there was a sacrifice that needed to be done. And there was no sacrifice worthy. There was nothing that could cover all of our sins. There was nothing that could cover the sins of the past, the past generation. And there was nothing, a sufficient animal that was worthy to be sacrificed to cover the sins of future generations. So what needed to happen is that there needed to be a worthy sacrifice, a great enough sacrifice. There needed to be blood. There needed to be death. Something needed to take the place for our sins, for our unworthiness, for our rebellion. And there was no no animal. There was nothing found. So God said, the only thing that can cover the blood, the only thing that can, the only thing that can cover their sins is the blood of the lamb, the true lamb. And that's Jesus. And so if you're taking notes, the first thing there is that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. There was no other animal, there was no other thing that could die to take the place of our sins. And because Jesus, Jesus was blameless. Jesus was without sin. Jesus was perfect. He was able to take our place. Now this is what the Bible says in Luke chapter 23. Verse 14, this is Pilate because they accused Jesus and they said, man, this man, this man is up to no good. And they said, Pilate, you need to, you need to check this man out, man, because he's no good. And Pilate comes and he checks him and then he, break, he says to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined them in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. This is what Isaiah 53, 7 says. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Even though he knew he wasn't guilty, he still kept his mouth shut. How many of us are willing to keep our mouth shut? We go to court, we're like, ah, heck no, uh uh-uh, judge. (laughs) Shoot, we, we start fighting before we even get in there. We're like, uh-uh, you're walking through the doors of the courthouse. You're like, uh-uh, they ain't going to find me guilty, you know. We, we'll talk, right? But Jesus kept his mouth shut because he knew that that was the price paid for our freedom. He shut his mouth so that you can live. He kept quiet so that you can be set free. He, he took your place on that cross so that you can walk around and do whatever you want to do in this world. He gave you the access to freedom. And then 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. He had no sin, yet he had to become sin. He had to become unworthy. He, he He was so terrible that he consumed sin so much that God turned his back on him. Couldn't be in the same presence with him. He became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He died so that we can have access to him. And then not only was he the perfect sacrifice, but Jesus was the righteous priest. He was the antitype of of Aaron. You see, Aaron, he had to go submit himself and cleanse himself because he was a man. He was imperfect. But Jesus, the reason he was the righteous priest was because he was God. 
He was, he was, he was God. He was blameless. He was sinless. He was without sin. He, he was born of a vir- he had a virgin birth. He was perfect. He was the righteous priest. There was no sin in him. And, and this, is, this is what's so amazing is that this is what Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 says this. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Now go with me to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one. Who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. He, he, was, he was able to intercede for you because he knows exactly what you're going through. He, he was able to mediate because he knew what you went through, but he was able to mediate because he remained sinless. He remained without sin, so he remained perfect. Then Jesus atoned for the nation. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth, called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship, In Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in this world. You know, this this promise of of, of life in heaven with God was not not for us. We we were excluded from his promise. This this promise wasn't for me, it wasn't for you. You ever been excluded from something? It's the worst feeling in the world. All your, you, you find out the next day that all your friends went to eat without you. <laughs> You're like, where's our girls? <laughs> what is, I didn't, and you start checking your phone. You start, maybe they called me and they didn't tell me, you know. You start scrolling. You're like, no, no, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, <laughs> you know. And then you find out that they dissed you on purpose, <laughs> you know. You're like, it's okay. <laughs> and then you get all, fine, I'll just go without them, <laughs> you know. You ever been excluded, man? It feels, it feels horrible. But how great is it when you can be included into something? This is what verse 13 says. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of him, we were included. You know, I, when I was a little kid, my, my, all my family used to go to the same church. My uncles. And all of us, we'd all go to the same church. It was, it was awesome. And one of my favorite cousins, you know, I would always want to go to her house. And I, I was always, like, trying to sneak my way in because back in the day, I don't know if you remember Wyatt Cafeteria. <laughs> those of y'all, y'all are like, Wyatt Cafeteria, woo. Do those even exist? <laughs> well, back in the day, I had an uncle, my Uncle Herb, man. He used to love Wyatt Cafeteria. That was his favorite restaurant. That was his go-to place. And so my family would go home and make webbles and stuff, make eggs to eat. And I was like, mm. I'm like, man, I'm going to go. I'm going to sneak in to ride with them, <laughs> you know. And so, and so every weekend my, my, my aunt would say, hey, mijo, do you want to go with us? And I'm like, yes. And so I would jump in the car. I'm like six years old. I'm in the truck, and my uncle looks back in the vehicle and says, who invited this guy? And I'm like. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a little kid, I was six years old. And then, and then my uncle would be like, "What did you at least bring money?" And I'm like, "I'm six years old." <laughs> I'm like, I'm like this. And then, and then I knew I didn't have money, but you know, you still got a check. You're like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, like you're trying to do your part to pay, right? You're like this. You know, I don't know. And I'm all a little kid. I feel shame. I feel guilt. I'm like, oh. I'm already in the car. We're almost at the restaurant. He just realized I was in the car. <laughs> and we're there, and I'm just like, and then all of a sudden my aunt, my aunt goes, oh, leave him alone. I invited him. I'll pay for him. And I was like, yes. <laughs> I was like, hmm. 
And then so I'd be in the line, you know, you got to wait, you got to get your plate, your tray, and I'd get my tray, but I didn't know if I was going to eat or not, you know, because my uncle just made a big deal about me not eating or not having money. And so I'm in the line with the tray, and I'm just kind of like looking at all the food, the salad's passing by. I'm like, good, I wasn't going to eat that anyway. And so I'm just kind of passing through all the, <laughs> passing through all the little vegetables and all the fruits, and I'm like, hmm. And so, and so I would go in and be like, my uncle would be like, well, are you going to eat or not? And I'm like, yes. And I'll be like, can I get that steak? <laughs> and, you know, every once in a while, I'll try to be slick, and I'll try to put the little mousse cake, chocolate mousse cake on there. <laughs> and when my uncle would catch it, he'd be like, oh, no, no, no dessert. And I'm like, but there was once in a while where I would get it through, and he'd like. <sighs> and what's funny is that that would happen almost every Sunday. It was the same routine every Sunday. And up to now, I don't know if he was serious or not, because I was little. But. But what gave me confidence is knowing that even though my uncle didn't want me there, my aunt, you know, had the final word, you know. And so what, what's crazy is this. What's so awesome is this, that even though you weren't included to this party, God said, I got to have them here anyway. You, you weren't included in the promise to be with God for eternity. But he said, I want them here. Bring them in here. They're with me. You, because of Jesus, you have VIP access to heaven. It wasn't for you, but he loved you way too much to leave you outside by yourself. He loved you too much to not let you in. He says, because of me, because of his, because of his death, because of his life, and because he rose from the dead, you have access to God. Man, I, you, you're included. He atoned for your life. This is what uh, 1 Peter 1.18 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. That's, that's the reason that we celebrate freedom today. It's not because somebody told us we were going to be free. It's because God Almighty came down himself and said, I'm going to set you free. It's because of Jesus. He atoned for the nation. He made what was right. He, he came in. He was blameless. He was the perfect priest. And he came in and atoned for, for you and I. And he atoned for the nation. And in number four, he atoned for the sanctuary. Because the church is his sanctuary. We're his sanctuary. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is what, this is what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 says. It says, consequently... You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So God came to restore the sanctuary just like Aaron did. But not only did he do it on a church building or in a temple, but he did it inside your life. So that everywhere you can go, you can clarify who God is in your life. You can demonstrate who God is, who Christ is. And that's why today we have the opportunity to say, God, the sanctuary in my life, the worship in my heart, everything that's been in my life has been torn down, but I need you to build it back up. And so how does this all apply to us? Well, the Bible says in Matthew 27, 51, that th this is what it says. It says, and look, after Jesus rose, from the, after Jesus died and he, and, he, and he died for our sins, the Bible says that, that the curtain, the veil in the holy temple was broken and torn down. Now, that, that's symbolic. A lot of times I used to read over this and I didn't understand what that meant. Because the, the, the Bible says that the foundation shook and, and, and different things began to happen. And the veil was torn down. And I didn't get it. You see, at one time, only one person had limited access to God. And even then, there was a veil, a curtain that was right in between the ark or the presence of God and, and, and the priest. But when Jesus came, Jesus came and tore down that veil. So that every single one of us can have direct access to God. You don't, you don't need a priest to go before you. 
you, you don't need a pastor. You don't need a pope. You don't, you don't need any man to go before you because he tore that veil and you have unlimited access to God Almighty. You have access to his presence. If you don't take advantage of it, that's on you. But he's torn the veil and he says, you can come to me anytime you want. You have unlimited access. You know what that's like? It's like going to a buffet. Don't act like you've never been in a buffet before. Y'all looking at me like, no, nah, man, I'm about that healthy life. Maybe now, but <laughs> if you go to a buffet, what happens? You eat. You eat and you eat, you eat, you eat. <laughs> you get one plate, you get two plates, three plates. I remember one time I went with my uh, with my parents and we went to we went to after church and my my dad invited one of his friends to go to to go eat with us and we went to this Chinese buffet restaurant and we all were eating and me I'm already on my second third plate you know <laughs> you know how we do right Clint <laughs> second third plate I'm all like enjoying life you know what I'm saying and so <laughs> enjoying life that's funny right I like, mean I was enjoying life Woo! you know you get in front of a buffet and, 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 and so we're there, we're, we're, we're eating and stuff, and, and, and the guy that my, my dad invited, his friend, he only had one plate. And my dad said, that's all you can eat? That guy said, yeah, man, I'm not really that hungry. I'm ready for He goes, man, I can't go to war with you, man. <laughs> he goes, I'm never inviting you to a buffet with me. Because <laughs> he didn't take advantage, right? But, but when you go to a buffet, it's because you take advantage of it, right? You want to eat. You want to stuff your face. You want to. It's a gluttony event, right? And so <laughs> I'm not saying to go to a buffet, especially not healthy Chinese, right? But it ain't healthy. I went in there. I was like, man, healthy Chinese, I need to lose weight. Nope. <laughs> but what, what I am saying, what I am saying is this, that he's given us unlimited access where, where before, where before everything was limited and only one person could go before you. Now God says, I broke the veil. Everyone has access to me. All of us have access to God. And so what does that mean? That he's already done the work for you. All you have to do is come to him and say, God, I'm ready. And now, now what needs to happen is now you can pray. Now, now you can be the priest of your home. You have access. Listen, listen, I'm, I'm thankful for pastor and I'm thankful for, for all he does. But, but listen, pastor's not responsible for your family. Now that God has given you access to him, you can become the priest of your house. You can become the priest of your household. Now you can pray for your kids. The first thing that we got to do, though, just like, just like Aaron, and I believe that even though we don't do those things no more, they serve as a model for us. Because the very first thing that Aaron did was that he came and he cleansed himself before God. And see, before you can begin to pray for your kids, you need to pray for yourself. Before you begin to put standards on your kids, you need to have those standards for yourself. You need to say, man, I need to live up to those standards first. I, I, need to, I need to pray to God. I have access to God, but I need them for myself. You need to become the example. You need to become the example. You want your kids to pray? You need to pray. They need to watch you pray. They need to see how you do it. They need to hear you speak about God. They need you to, they need you to be the example. And, and you need it for yourself. So there needs to be cleansing in yourself. There needs to be a time of restoration in yourself. God's already given you the access. He's already torn down the barriers. He's saying, come to me, and I got you. All we have to do is come and say, God, God, I need you. I need restoration in my life. I need you to change everything that's been an obstacle in me, God. You know, you know what's crazy, though, is that a lot of us, we rather live a fake life. We come to church, and we'll, we'll put on the church face, the church mask, like, 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 like we're supposed to be perfect people. We're not, we're not perfect people. Man, we're broken people that need a Jesus every single day. We need a Savior every single day. I'm not perfect. I can guarantee you that. So don't put your eyes on me. You need to put your eyes on Jesus so that he can be the restorer of your life. We're going to continue struggling. So we need, to, we need to be consistent. We need to understand that restoration is a process. What happens sometimes 
is that we don't understand the word of God enough, so we mess up one time and we say, well, you know what? I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I'm going to leave church. We turn our back on God because we say we don't want to be a hypocrite. But the truth is, man, if hypocrites didn't go to church, churches wouldn't exist. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We, we're all, we, we all struggle in an area. We all have stuff that we're battling that we're struggling with. You know, that's why we need to come to church. We need, we need to understand that the restoration is a process. And then God is doing it in my life, and he's going to do it in yours. So what does it consist of? It consists of that, that your life needs to be constant. You need to continually renew your life. You need to continually come to God. God, I need you today, God. I, I need you today, God. I, I need you to help me today, God. I need you to forgive me today, God. You need to come to him. It's a daily chore. It's a daily activity. You come to him every day. You got to pray. You got to ask God. You got to tell him to change you. You got to ask him to cleanse your life. You got to read the word of God. You got to read the word of God. You want to know who God is. You need to get to know him through his word. Listen, we, a, a, a lot of us don't, don't, don't have never read the word of God. And so we'll believe all the stuff that people tell us. But if you understand, if you read the word of God, and if you have questions, man, ask. Go to your life group, man. Ask questions. Say, hey, man, I read this. I read this. I didn't understand it. It's okay to not know. Man, read the word of God. You know, the process, you got to receive correction. Understand that, that this, this process of restoration, man, it's going to require a lot of correction. A lot of correction. I've received correction since I was five years old. Probably at, I'm talking about at church. I was bad kid in church. I received correction ever since I was little, man, at church. I've had pastors tell me off and tell me stuff and be in my, be in my grill and tell me what I need to change and what I need to do. I still get correction. Pastor still gets in my grill, still gets tell me what I got to change, still what I got to do. It doesn't stop. You know, you, know, you, know what, you know what changes? is our heart. A lot of us can't accept correction. Pastor can't tell you nothing because all of a sudden, oh, oh why you got to tell me? Why do you got to single me out? Oh, oh why you got to tell me stuff, you know? And a lot of us won't grow because we don't receive the correction needed. Listen, I know that a lot of y'all were athletes or are athletes. If your coach doesn't help you correct some of the areas in your life, you'll never become what, he, what you're called to be. You'll never be the athlete that you could be. You'll always be a could have been, a would have been, and you'll never complete your potential. Some of you are, have not completed, reached your potential because you haven't allowed correction in your life. Correction is part of the process. We have to allow God to send people in our lives. If we want to be closer to God, if we want to grow in our potential, we need to allow correction in our lives. You know what's funny is that we'll cry to God and we'll tell God, man, God, give me opportunity, man. But opportunity comes with responsibility. And responsibility comes with accountability. And accountability is somebody watching over you, hovering over you, making sure you're doing it right so that they can release you at the right time. You're not being released because there's no accountability. You need, you, you need a lot of correction in your life, man. Not just one voice, not just one person. Man, you should have several people. I'm not saying that you need to open up and trust everyone because not everyone can be trusted. There's some people that just want to gossip and want to catch you in a, in a sin or in a lie. That's not who I'm talking about. Those people, you need to discard those people out of your life. I'm talking about you need to hang around with people that love you and care about you. And they're not going to judge you, but they're going to lift you up and get you back on a place of encouragement, a place of restoration. Those are the people you need to find in your life. You need to find correction. And you need to guard your heart from roots of bitterness. Man, you need to guard your heart. Because once you get offended... Once that little seed of offense gets planted in your heart, it becomes a root. And that root begins to grow and begins to stifle you, begins to hurt you, begins to keep you numb from your heart. You become cold to the things of God. All of a sudden, because you can't worship right because you're offended. You, you can't worship right because the person that offended you is worshiping his heart out. And you're like, oh, what the, what the heck is he worshiping about? He offended me. And all of a sudden, man, you, you're stifled. You know that when you release forgiveness for other people that hurt you, it's not for them. It's for you. When you release forgiveness, it's for you. You think that person's thinking about you? You think that person that hurt you is thinking about you? No. They're living their life. They probably don't even know they offended you. Well, he didn't shake my hand, so. 
They're going to be offended because I didn't, what? We offended, man. We, we're offended. We need to let God heal those little, those little roots, the, the, the roots of bitterness, man. We need to guard our heart from those things. And then, once before God can restore your family, he has to restore you. And so today, before we do anything else, we have to t- call, cry out to God and say, God, you need to purify my life. You need to restore my heart. You need to restore my life. You need to restore my spirit. We need, we need transparency in our lives. We need to be open. We need to be real. We need to stop hiding behind the lies. We need to stop hiding behind perfection and just admit that we're broken people that need a perfect God. We need transparency. You know, we're more worried about what people think than what God already knows. God knows all the junk in your life, man. God knows everything you've been through. God knows what you're going through right now. God knows what what you're hiding that you don't want to share share in life group. God knows all that stuff, man, all that junk. God knows it. So why are you worried about pleasing people for a life that's temporary? When When you got a chance to have access to God and be open and free for a chance at eternal life with God in heaven. We're too worried about pleasing people, man. We need to begin about pleasing God, about living for God. Stop living for people. Stop making about what other people think and make it about what God already knows about you. God, I need you in my life, God. I'm just being real, God. I need, I need forgiveness in my life. I need forgiveness in my heart. And once, and once God can release forgiveness in you, you can become restored. You can, you can be cleansed. You can, you can be broken and you can be brought to pieces again. And then God can have you stand in the gap. That's why Aaron needed to be, before he can, he can get in the gap for someone else, he needed to make sure he was cleansed first. That was the first thing God did with Aaron. He said, man, you want to be a priest? Well, you need to cleanse yourself first. You need to check yourself first. Once you get, let God check your life, once you let God cleanse you, once you let God restore you, then you still stand in the gap. You know what stand in the gap means? It means to, to stand in place between you and God and somebody that you love. You begin, to, you begin to pray for that person. And you begin to be, become that bridge for that person. And you, you stand in the gap. There's a, there's a space between people and God. And you stand in there and you link them and you say, God, I'm, I'm praying for this person. You know what that requires? It requires that you begin to intercede. It begins that, 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 that you, became, you, you begin to cry out. You begin to war. That's why when the day of the atonement was happening, he needed to cry out. Uh, Aaron needed to cry out for himself. He needed to pray for his family. He needed to pray for his nation. He needed to pray for the sanctuary. He needed to pray for these things because all these things had been violated. And God needed someone to stand in the gap on behalf of the nation. I need somebody, man, that would stand up and say, man, God, I just want to please you, man. I want to do whatever I can. Listen, I'm not going to be perfect, God, but I'm going to do whatever I can to honor your heart, to honor your words, to honor your word. To stand in the gap. You begin to intercede. Man, turn off the TV for a little bit. Put down your phone and begin to say, God, I'm praying for the people that are on my network right now. You begin to pray. That's why you intercede. You begin to pray for your family. Begin to lay hands on your kid. Before they, go to, before they go to school, you should be praying for them. You should, even if you take off early, man, go inside by your kid's room and say, man, God, I'm praying an anointing over my kid. I'm praying protection. I'm praying blessing, God. And head to wherever you need to go. But, man, go in there. Pray for your family. Lay hands on them. Give them a word of encouragement. Tell them they're men and women of God. Raise them up as champions. Tell them. Tell them that they're important to God. Pray. Pray for your family. Pray for your nation. Pray for the city. Pray for your community. Pray for your island. Begin to pray. We need need compassion. You know where compassion is birthed from? Compassion is birthed by who you hang with. Whatever, Whatever is important to the people you hang with becomes important to you. Find out the things that you do. You'll find out who's your best friend, who the people you hang out with the most. You're going to find yourself doing the things that they like to do. And if you're submit, more submissive than the other person, you're always going to do the things that they like to do, right? Some of y'all are like, mm. <laughs> If you spend time with God and you pray and you connect with God and you read his word, what, what's important to him will become important to you. What breaks for him will begin to break for you. And, and you know what breaks for God? His community, lost souls. 
people that don't come to church. You know what happens when you begin to, to have a, a time with God and God begins to restore your life? You become less selfish. You, you stop thinking less about yourself and more about others. You know, when, when we don't spend enough time with God, that's when you'll see selfishness. That's when you'll see an ego trip. That's when you'll see the, oh, well, he didn't shake my hand trip, <laughs> right? But when, but when you, you've been in, in time with God, you say, man, I'm going to go up to that brother. Something must be wrong over here. Hey, man, you doing all right? How's it going? It, it's no longer about you. It's no longer about they need to come to me or they need to serve me. It's, a, it's about I, I, I understand my role as a child of God. I'm called to be a priest. I'm called, I'm called, to, I'm called to intercede. Man, they, they, if they don't want to come to me, I'm going to them. You begin to break that pride. You begin to break that pride that is inside of family. So you begin to pray for your family. Pray for the nation. Pray for your, your community, your church. And then... You begin to pray for the altar. Man, the worship that's in shambles. I mean, that's why pastor's been, over the weeks and over the months, he's been, he's been challenging us to, to worship. And, I, and I, I'm going to be honest with you. There's some Sundays that I've come, and I'm so busy with stuff that I know needs to get done. And, and I'm over here, my mind's here, my mind's there. That, man, I need a, I need a reminder to, to, to worship God. Man, we, we know that our, our week's all about being crazy and busy. So, man, we need, we need that reminder to say, hey, man, you guys need to come to this altar and take advantage and take advantage of this access with God. We need to restore our worship. We need to restore. We need to restore freedom in our lives. We need to restore that altar. And only this way can there be freedom in our lives. Because of this, there can be freedom in our lives. You know what it starts with? It starts with God restoring me first. It's saying, God, you need to come in here first. It's about putting down all the, stop fronting. That was a word we used to use back in the day. Stop fronting. Stop acting like something you're not. Right? Stop, stop being fake. Stop worrying about what people think and say, man, I need God today. I need restoration in my life. Would you, would you stand with me? Right there where you're at, just bow your heads and close your eyes. I believe with all my heart that God wants to do something in you, with you, through you. He wants to raise something powerful through you. But before you can begin to intercede for the nation, and before you can, you can stand in the gap for someone else, you need to stand in the gap for yourself. You need to cry out to God today for freedom. You need to tell God today, God, you need to, you need to cleanse me. You need to purify my heart. My heart's rotten right now, God. My, my heart's full of all this junk and all, this, all these obstacles and all these thoughts and all these, all these lustful things in my life. And I need you to cleanse me today, God. I want to begin to live a life that would honor you. God, I'm not trying to be perfect. God, I just want to be a person that honors you with my walk, with my life. Now today, if you're here and you can be honest, and you can be sincere and say, I need God to forgive me. I need God to restore my life. Without hesitation. If you're that person that needs your life cleansed and you need God to just change and restore your life, right there where you're at, just raise your hand. That's good. That's good. That's good. Come on. I want to invite you, if you have your hand up, just to come and make your way in this altar. Come on. Don't be afraid. You already went halfway. Go all the way. Come through. Come to this altar. Yes. I want you to keep your eyes closed and I want you to raise your right hand. And I want you to say with me, I want you to say, God, today I recognize that my life is not meeting your standard. But God, I know that I'm called for more. Today I pray that you change me, that you restore my life. 
that you bring freedom to me. Change me forever. I belong to you. I accept Jesus as my Savior. And from today and on, I begin to live for you. Come on, lift up your hands. Begin to worship God. In your own words, you begin to tell him, God, here I am. I'm sorry, God. Please, God, forgive me. I stand in the gap for myself first, God. I pray that you lead.